If you play sports, you've heard coaches shout, let's get down to the basics. And parents, you all know the saying, it's as easy as ABC. Hello, I'm Betty Hollister, Public Information Manager with the Regional Flood Control District, and welcome to another edition of the Flood Channel. On today's show, we're going back to the basics about flood-related topics affecting you and your family. First, we'll learn the ABCs of flood insurance and what to look for when buying a home. After that, we'll take you back in time as we chronicle some of the history of flooding in Southern Nevada. Then we'll get behind the wheel to discover the hazards of driving in rainy weather. And finally, we'll see what happens when you dial 911 in a flood emergency. All that, our Flood 101 and Pollution Solution segments coming up next on this edition of the Flood Channel. Welcome back to the Flood Channel. For many, buying a home is the American dream. It can be one of the most important purchases of your life. It can also be a very intimidating process filled with lots of questions. What's the neighborhood like? Are there parks and schools nearby? But have you ever thought to question if the area ever experienced flooding before, or if that possibility even exists? We sent the newest addition to the Flood Channel team, Carrie Ann Schreiner, to sort out some of the ABCs of flood insurance and buying a home. Well, I'm off on my first big assignment for the Flood Channel, but before I start looking at homes for sale, I want to go talk to an insurance agent about the importance of flood insurance. Now, I wouldn't even think of driving this car if I didn't have the proper insurance, and the same thing could be said about insurance for your home. The bottom line is you can live miles away from a high-risk flood area, but flooding is America's most common natural disaster. It can happen anytime, anywhere, even in the desert. So the question is, why take a chance by not having flood insurance to protect your home? Let's go find out. So Bill, I'm looking at buying a home. What is your recommendation for flood insurance? Flood insurance is affordable, particularly if you live in a non-flood area. Uh, for example, a $200,000 policy would cost $296 a year, and that would include $80,000 in contents coverage. And it's just a, a flat premium policy, and uh, it would cover flood and flood only. With a homeowner's policy, you got to understand that flood insurance is never covered by a homeowner's policy, simply because it's, it's hard to rate on a regular homeowner's because only people that were in a flood zone would buy it, and those people that weren't in a flood zone wouldn't, and therefore uh, everybody would be paying for the people that are living in a flood zone. Most people, the honest truth of the matter is, most people don't buy it. They just don't feel like it's something that's ever going to happen to them. Now that we've learned about the importance of flood insurance, let's meet Doug Bradford of Realty Executives. He'll walk us through what to look for when purchasing a home and how you can find out if that home is in a flood zone. Well, one of the first things you need to really take a look at is certainly go out with a realtor because they are the individuals who are the experts in the business and they know the communities you're in. Second thing is when it comes to the flood control is go on the internet, find out whether or not your home is in a flood zone and any good realtor will do that for you. The first thing I do is go on to uh, regionalflood.org page comes up, I look for the little icon that says flood zone. Click onto that. Another page comes up that directs me to the address and the street, so I type that information in. And voila, up comes a page that shows the map, shows me what uh, the area is and whether or not it's in a flood zone. Also gives me the property owner's name as well. So it's a really good tool for me because then I can take that to my buyer or my seller and let them know whether or not it's important for them to buy flood insurance. You have the, the backyard over here. That's a big, huge half acre worth of land that at this point was re-engineered and redesigned. Whether or not a homeowner buys flood insurance, that's a personal choice. It's a personal decision they have to make. But I would recommend that they go onto the website, 
take a look at that site, do all the research that's necessary, and then talk to their insurance agent to see whether or not that's something that they should do down the street. And when it does, you know, that's where you got to be careful. But you can see, see where the water goes along the edge there, where the rocks are. That's how it travels, because as you know, the roads go like this, and the water goes off to the sides. But in a rural area, you don't have a lot of... Um... One of the things I would recommend is create yourself a little checklist. Now go to the neighborhood, take a look at the homes in the area, check to see if it has curbs and gutters. Talk to your neighbors about the drainage flow, if, if that's something you would like to do. Um, get an overall feel of how the water drains through the area. Check to see if there's any uh, flood channels in the area. Uh, that would give you an indication that, there, uh, that the flood control district is concerned about the neighborhood that you're going to look at. One of the great things about the district, though, is that they've got a 30-year plan, and they've really worked hard for the past 20 years that I know of, that I've lived here, in creating a, an atmosphere and an environment where floods do not happen anymore. I can remember floods just uh, for this entire valley, places you wouldn't imagine flooding, they have flooded. So going back to what the flood control district has done they've done a phenomenal job and they still got more work to do and that's what i think is important for people to understand that there's a lot of work still to be done but a lot has already been accomplished so far we've discovered the importance of flood insurance and we've covered how you can determine if your home is in a flood zone now let's catch up with district board chairman and las vegas city councilman larry brown to determine some of the myths and facts of flood insurance You can only buy flood insurance if you live in a high-risk flood zone. That's not true. Anyone in Southern Nevada can purchase flood insurance. We recommend you talk to your personal insurance agent just to make sure. Federal disaster assistance covers flood damage to your home. Not necessarily. If an area that's experienced flooding is declared a federal disaster area by the president, People may qualify for low interest loans, but in those type events, less than 50% fall into that category. Only property owners in high risk flood zones need flood insurance. Again, not necessarily true. They may be at a lower risk to experience flood damage, but everyone should consider purchasing flood insurance regardless. As we experienced in 2003, we had a storm event that was uncharacteristic for Southern Nevada. It came down in the same spot, didn't move, and for 45 minutes straight brought damage throughout the area that we had never experienced, and it's far greater than a 100-year event. Homeowners insurance policies cover flooding from rain. No, again, not necessarily true. When you have a leak in your roof, your normal home insurance would cover that. But when it comes to damage to your home by flooding or flood waters, you need to again evaluate flood insurance specifically for that event. Thank you, Councilman Brown, for clearing up some of the myths and facts of flood insurance. Well, my first assignment for the Flood Channel is a wrap, and I've learned a lot about protecting my home. For the Flood Channel, I'm Carrie Ann Schreiner. Betty? Great job, Carrie Ann, on your first assignment. We'll be back with more on the Flood Channel after this. Whenever you come to water in a roadway, think. If you think you can get across, you can't. If you think driving fast will get you through it, it won't. If you think it's not that deep, it is. Whenever you come to water, think. Then, think again. A reminder from the Clark County Regional Flood Control District. I'm the happiest mayor in the world that you're watching the Flood Channel. What are the chances of my house being flooded? Over the course of a 30-year mortgage, you have a 1 in 4 chance of experiencing a flood versus a 1 in 10 chance of experiencing a fire. To put it another way, you have 2.5 times greater risk of experiencing a flood versus a fire. Reports of flooding in the county date back nearly a century. 
We believe that understanding and analyzing the history of flooding will help us be better prepared for the future. Let's take a look back at some devastating storms and see how we can be better prepared. Flooding in Southern Nevada. Perhaps you've seen it on television, read about it in the newspaper, or maybe even experienced it firsthand. But many residents here are new to the area and unaware of how life-threatening floods can be. Recorded reports about dangerous floods in the community date back to 1905, which is the first year a newspaper was published in Southern Nevada. Back then, when storms led to excessive flooding, they crippled communication and telegraph wires and shut down roads and railroad tracks, making travel almost impossible. From those first published accounts to present day, Southern Nevada has experienced scores of storms that had devastating impacts to families, their homes, and businesses. A major storm in 1949 was dubbed by the newspaper as one of the worst in history, causing flooding from Las Vegas to 90 miles north in Mesquite. Another devastating storm was recorded in 1975 as floodwaters slammed into the valley, bringing death and destruction. More than 300 cars at Caesars Palace were submerged, many piled on top of each other by the power of the floodwater while others were found miles downstream from the strip. Storms in the early 80s resulted in several deaths, millions of dollars in damages, and the creation of the Regional Flood Control District in 1985. More recently, in 1999, a 100-year storm left many parts of the valley looking like raging rivers. More than 150 people were rescued by emergency crews, most of them stranded motorists. The storm resulted in more than $20 million in damage to public property. In 2003, another 100-year storm dumped three inches of rain in 90 minutes in the Northwest Valley. Both helicopter and swift water rescues were performed to save trapped motorists. Several homes in the area were also severely damaged. And just two years ago, winter storms in early 2005 brought heavy rain and snow melt, which caused the Virgin and Muddy Rivers to overflow their banks, flooding homes and businesses in Mesquite and Overton. While most severe storms were recorded between July and September, over the past 100 years, flash flooding in Clark County has happened in every month of the year. Through construction and education, the district continues its mission to make Southern Nevada and its residents safer from flood emergencies. I walked into my home and I just stood there. And there's two and a half to three feet of water coming down into our property like the Colorado River. It looked like there was a river right outside of our home. The water, the force of the water broke through my front door, broke through the garage, and the water immediately started filling the house. And just the initial reaction of walking into your home and finding everything caked in mud, water up the sides of the walls, and it took my breath away to see all the damage and you, you don't know what, what to do. You don't know where to start. You don't know how to react. I remember just standing there and crying for a couple hours before my adrenaline kicked in and said, I've got to start getting stuff out of the mud. The very first thing I did was call my insurance company. I assumed that my homeowner's insurance was going to cover it. Wrong. I still, the whole time, look back and think, if I had only had the insurance, if I had only had the wherewithal to take out flood insurance, it was inexpensive and it would have saved me $50,000.
I didn't let my daughter come home for four days because her room was destroyed. She stayed away. I couldn't let her come home and see what had been destroyed in her room. By learning about the history of flooding, the district is taking a proactive approach to ensure that current and future residents are better informed about the potential dangers of flash flooding. And while we're constantly building flood control improvements that reduce the risk of flooding, they don't eliminate it completely, and that's where flood safety comes in. If you have a story about flash flooding that you'd like to share with us, we'd love to hear from you. Email us at regionalflood.org. Your story might be part of a future Flood Channel show. Stay right there. We'll be back with more on the Flood Channel after this. Ah, <sighs> springtime. When thoughts turn to cleaning? Hey, it's great you want to clean out your garage. Just be careful where you dispose of things like old paint, batteries, pesticides, weed killer, and other potentially dangerous chemicals. Many things can be left out on recycling day. However, dangerous pollutants must go to a recycling center for proper disposal. Never dump into a storm drain. It may end up polluting Lake Mead, our primary source of drinking water. Learn more at lvstormwater.com. Brought to you by the Clark County Regional Flood Control District. Hi, I'm Bill Castle with the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, and you're watching the Flood Channel. What should I do if I see trash blocking storm drains? If you should see trash in the drainage ways or someone dumping pollutants into the storm drain, you can contact us through our website at regionalflood.org. Just click on Contact Us. You can also call us at 455-3139. Did you know that just two feet of water can sweep an SUV off the road? And most flood-related deaths happen to people trapped in flooded cars. Why? Because people underestimate the destructive power, force, and speed of flood water. Some drivers even ignore barricades driving through flooded areas. We sat down with Paul Pate at CCSN to learn the ABCs of driving in unpredictable weather. This course is, is set up to simulate everyday road conditions. There's some sharp turns and some uh, fading turns and differences in pavement and that's what a driver is going to experience every day driving down the road. The goals of the course are to teach people to drive properly, to avoid skid situations, to avoid a situation where they can't, uh, they don't have the skill necessary to save the car from an accident. And when we talk about dangerous road situation, when you get to rainy conditions, you know, with, like you were talking about streets being slick, I would assume that, you know, that's even compounded. It, it absolutely is compounded because now we don't have as much time to react to a situation. And when we do react, we don't want to overreact. The biggest reason car would skid would be lack of traction. Um, and the reason people get into a lack of traction situation is typically too much speed. Uh, they're driving too fast for the conditions and, and while 60 or 70 may be fine one day, the very next day it's not an appropriate speed due to the road condition. Whether there's sand on the road from all the gravel trucks to drive around or rain that has fallen and oil has come up from the pavement and created a slippery surface. Um, or a, a number of other things, cones, construction, all types of things. The most common type of skid would be a front wheel skid and that's the most difficult skid to recover from and what causes those type of skid typically are just a little bit of rain on the road. You know, when it sprinkles it's actually more dangerous than when it's been raining for a couple hours and the reason why is it doesn't rain often enough in Vegas obviously. We get a buildup of oil and chemicals on the road and so you get a little bit of sprinkling and petroleum is lighter than water, so it floats to the surface. And so now you're driving on a, a surface of oil rather than a surface of asphalt. So that's the most common, and it happens when it sprinkles. The next step is after it's been raining for a while, we start to get flooding. And cars, actually, they, they'll float just a bit. So if you're driving down the road and water builds up between the tire and the surface, you now have no control between your car and the road surface. So you can't do an accident avoidance maneuver. It's difficult to stop, it's difficult to change directions, change lanes, do those types of things. If you're just creeping along and it's curb deep to get through an intersection, that's a lot different. If it's flowing water, bad idea. Never go into a flowing water situation because the current will overpower the gravity of the car. I mean, you only have so much that presses the car down against the pavement and you're relying on those tires pressing against the pavement and the friction there to keep the car from floating away. 
The car's going to float just by design. Driving is a choice, and you had to make the choice to put yourself in that situation in the first place. The best thing you can do during storms is to either take different routes or choose to make your appointments at a different time and avoid those intersections, those areas that are low-lying. Uh, the places we all know around town where there's going to be flood water every single time it rains, avoid that area. So we've just learned some expert driving advice about what to do if you find yourself caught in a heavy downpour. And we now know the number one priority is to stay safe by pulling over and waiting out the storm rather than trying to drive through or around it. But what would be even safer? Not getting in your car at all. Staying dry and staying safe. I want to show you some pictures your parents probably wouldn't want you to see. Pictures of parents making big mistakes. Here's someone's dad doing something foolish. He's actually trying to drive through a flooded street. Here's another. And another. Every summer we get flash floods. And every summer the same thing happens. And hey, if all this water can do this to a car, imagine what it'd do to a kid. Look, don't be foolish. Flash floods kill. Tell your parents. A reminder from the Clark County Regional Flood Control District. Hi, we're Station 21 Heavy Rescue. And you're watching the Flood Channel. Everyday emergency workers put their lives on the line to save people caught in dangerous situations, from police and firefighters to emergency operators and paramedics. They protect our loved ones. But what happens when there's a flood? And how do these emergency workers jump into action? Eric Harrington has a story from County Fire Station 21. Okay, let's go over this step by step. First, an emergency call is made. Hello, I have a flood emergency to report. That call goes directly to a police dispatch center. Come on, let's go there now. An emergency operator will answer your call. But what happens next? Let's go to one of Las Vegas' finest, Metro Officer Bill Castle. When a citizen dials 911, the call comes into our dispatch center. It's screened to determine whether or not it's a police, fire, or medical emergency. From there, the call is sent to the appropriate responding agency. If it is a flood emergency, many times our dispatchers stay on the line with the fire department if they conference with fire, or they send it directly out to Metro Search and Rescue. Every police officer receives some level of flood awareness training in the academy that they go to. Those who are tasked with dealing with flood rescues, the search and rescue section, receive intensive training in both swift water rescue techniques and high angle rescue techniques. Many of the rope rescue techniques and systems that we use in mountain rescues are also applicable to technical flood rescues. The primary responsibility of the police officers and the fire department is to stabilize the situation and extricate the victim from any distress that they may be in or any potential danger they may be in. From Metro, a city dispatch operator will call other emergency personnel to respond. This could include police, fire, swift water rescue, and paramedics. But what classifies an emergency? Another of our brave responders, Las Vegas Fire and Rescue Public Information Officer, Tim Szymanski, makes it perfectly clear. Well, anytime we get a report that somebody might be trapped inside a vehicle or maybe in a wash, we're gonna classify it as a swift water rescue, which means that the firefighters in the station know that they're gonna have to rescue somebody from water. If people call us, we're going to respond regardless. Any call that comes into 911, we have to respond on a call. And if it has anything to do with flooding or swift water, we're going to respond on it as an emergency call. Sometimes we get there and we find out that they're not actually emergencies, but we don't know that at the time that it comes into the 911 center. So if anybody calls us, we respond and we check it out. One young lady kind of panicked and she drove around me as the water was coming down off the mountainside. She got maybe about um, 30 feet in front of us and the water picked her up and carried her off into the deep side and it completely spun her car around. The water was so forceful that when it hit the car it would go over and you could actually not see the car. All we could see was her head inside the car so we had to uh, rig some lines up, get some firefighters to go out there and, and, and pull her out of the car. Had she done exactly what she was told to stay in her vehicle, um, she probably would have went home with no damage, but um, she was shaken up pretty badly and her car was ruined because of the floodwaters. During an emergency, someone could be hurt. 
Paramedics then become a key player in saving lives. Let's visit with Stephen Kramer. He's a paramedic with American Medical Response. Uh, one of the first things we do when we pull somebody out of a flood emergency is to uh, do an assessment on them to see what their initial emergency is. If it's a cold water rescue, then we have to deal with hypothermia. We have to remove their clothes uh, from them and start to warm them up. Then we'll deal with their initial life-threatening emergencies, such as they're in cardiac arrest or have any broken bones or any medical conditions that need to be treated. Most of the people that are in the emergency medical services profession get into it because of the feeling they get when they uh, see somebody's life change for something that they've done to them. Uh, responding to the emergency call, seeing the need that they have, dealing with the medical situation, treating them, and seeing some relief on their face once they get them into the hospital. Let's head back to the fire station. Hopefully, I get to ride in a fire truck. Well, a 911 call comes in. We um, immediately start thinking that the call, the, a swift water call is a dynamic call. It's going to move from one location to the other, depending on the speed of the water and the amount of rain or flooding that's, that's involved. So where one call comes in in one spot, the victim's going to be downstream. So I start moving units downstream immediately to try to be there. And then we'll move down accordingly and try to catch up to the call. But it's a very complicated call. You get a fire in a building, you know where it's going to be. Swift water call, it could be, by the time you get there, it could be a half mile down. It's a very dynamic call, and it, it calls for some special equipment. Um, what's good for firefighting, such as turnouts and, and heavy helmets, th those things are built to drown you in a swift water call, so we have to bring out special gear. We change our footwear, we will uh, put on jumpsuits, we put on uh, personal flotation devices, we put on helmets, we grab rope bags to throw to victims, we start thinking about different assets that we can use to help us get out of different situations. We asked the world's happiest mayor just how important are emergency response teams to the Valley. The first responder really puts themselves in harm's way. They're heroes in the fact that uh, they're there, they're called upon whenever we have a disaster. And uh, they're the first ones to be out in the field. They snatch us out of the, uh, the torrent of, of waters uh, that are created by a flood. Uh, they uh, they rescue, uh, even firefighters rescuing firefighters uh, uh, because they put themselves in harm's way. So uh, you can't thank these folks enough for what they do for us. We're very fortunate uh, that we have a community where uh, everybody uh, takes their responsibilities very, very seriously. Uh, the firefighters, the police officers, uh, those who respond to issues that we have uh, that uh, really uh, take uh, a, a great deal of uh, uh, bravery. Uh, they have to be, they can't be taken for granted. They have to be thanked for what they do. And that's what happens when you make an emergency flood call. We've learned a lot and showed you what happens when you make an emergency call. But most importantly, we've met the brave emergency personnel that put their lives on the line every day for you and your family. Way to go, Eric. And that's going to do it for this edition of the Flood Channel here at the dog park at Gallo North Detention Basin. For all of us here at the Flood Channel, I'm Betty Hollister, and remember to always be flood safe.